It was in Palestine under the British mandate when I was in first or maybe second grade when a mother of a classmate of mine stopped to ask me a question. What are you, Ze'eva, she asked. I was truly perplexed and did not know what to say. She repeated her question a couple of times until I came up with, I'm Jewish. Well, she said, what kind of a Jew are you? What do you mean, I asked. There are German Jews, Polish Jews, Russian Jews. I had no answer. When I came home, I asked my mother what I was. My mother answered, you are Jewish. What kind of a Jew, I asked, and further elaborated, there are German, Polish, Russian Jews. My mother said, we are Yemenite Jews. I remember not quite liking this answer. Intuitively, I felt that it was not to my advantage and had already begun to be a burden. My mother was born in old Tel Aviv and my father arrived in Israel from Egypt with his Yemenite mother and uncle at age four. As soon as they married, my parents left Neve Tzedek, their family's poor neighborhood, and moved from south to North Tel Aviv, which was then the newly built and modern neighborhood. Their goal was to join their Irgun Ashkenazi comrades in arms who resisted the British rule and fully integrate into the secular and modern European Jewish culture. They were part of the effort to create a new reality and image for the Jew of Israel. My apartment building had eight units where eight families lived. And while the language spoken with the children was Hebrew, among themselves, adults spoke their home languages. As children, we could easily identify the sound of Polish, Hungarian, Czech, and German. Yiddish was spoken only by the Vilners, the family who lived in the garden apartment and had two daughters. As a child, I always considered the Vilners to be my second home and Bluma to be my alternate mother. Their home was my refuge when my parents involved in the Ergun underground movement were absent. To me, therefore, the sound of Yiddish became the language of love, intimacy, and nourishment. This sentiment coexisted with the covert attitude of the Israeli youth of my time who avoided or rather distanced themselves from Yiddish because for them it represented sentiments of pain and shame. It was a language of the Galut, meaning the Jewish diaspora. Sorry the Jewish diaspora that led to the Holocaust. We were being taught, after all, to become the new Jew of Israel, free, brave, and strident. My family was the only family of Yemenite Mizrahi descent living in that Ashkenazi neighborhood, and I was raised on Western tradition and culture. Only Hebrew was spoken at home, and I could not communicate with one of my grandmothers who spoke only Arabic. In school, I learned Western history and culture, including Jewish authors of the early 20th century, math, science, a secular approach to reading the Bible and its Aramaic, Aramaic interpretations, as well as English and French. Looking back, it is evident that while Israel's success to quickly unify Jews who came from all corners of the world with no common language or culture, was achieved by opting for a secular Western education, as well as modern Hebrew as the common national language. This came at the price of neglecting rich Middle Eastern and Sephardic Jewish traditions. These traditions were marginalized and consequently, consequently made to feel and appear inferior. I can also recognize that this neglect was also true of Yiddish language and culture. It would have been embarrassing for me as a second generation Israeli to speak Arabic or Yiddish in Israel or create dances associated with these traditions. By now, I'm sure that at least some of you think that my presentation might, might reveal a sense of victimhood. If so, I'm delighted to inform you that if given the option of reliving my life, I would not have cha changed a thing, sorry. 
Ida Cole. Ha! Huh. The excellent education I got, and primarily my creative dance training in Israel with Gertrude Krauss of the German Expressionist Dance Movement, followed by my intensive training in the Graham tradition, sorry, technique, and later with Anna Sokolo, prepared me to be part of the international dance conversation and practice. How else could I have been ready to move to New York in my early 20s, study at Juilliard, lead a life as dancer and choreographer whose work was relevant and appreciated by American audiences, how else could I have built a dance program for Princeton University? It is only now, however, since my retirement, when more time and energy have become available for reflection, that I better understand why it took so long for me as a choreographer to reconnect with my Yemenite heritage and allow it to integrate with my Western upbringing and training. It is also clear now that this long process could only be activated once I was away from Israel and working in New York, where, uh, sorry, in New York, where I've lived since my early 20s and where all religions and cultures coexist and no collective memory of only one people's history weighs on an artistic creativity. Before I discuss and show you video excerpt of my work that trace the process of reconnecting with my Jewish Yemenite heritage, I would like to clarify that most of my work is not centered on Jewish or Jewish Yemenite themes. My goal as a young artist was to find my individual voice as a human being relating to the larger world. Over the years, sorry. It has become clear that in order to do this, I cannot ignore my own heritage, which then and now is alive in my body. So how and when was I introduced to traditional Yemenite dance and culture? Since my parents hardly ever took me to visit my grandmothers in the old neighborhood of Neve Tzedek, my main exposure to Yemenite dance was in context of the Israeli folk dance, which children encountered either in school, in the various public squares, or in context of the youth movement to which they belonged. While the Yemenite step as adopted by the European folk dance choreographers seemed bland, Sarah Levitanai's choreographed folk dances, danced to her original songs in Yemenite styles, felt like the real thing. They were richer, and at least for me, more enjoyable to perform. My mother's exposure to the Yemenite dance culture, sorry, my other, <laughs> how did I bring mother in? My other early exposure to the Yemenite dance culture occurred during my grandmother's 60th birthday party that the Yemenite community organized for her. The exuberant party took place in her large all-purpose living room in Evet Tzedek. The amazing joy and spontaneity expressed in the singing, drumming, and dancing was a total surprise. I <clears throat> Sorry. I was enchanted. I need to drink something, sorry. Okay. Where was I? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Found it, found it. Okay. I, I was enchanted, but also felt like an outsider. I could only observe, but not participate. The thought of why didn't I know this kind of joy existed in my parents' traditional community passed through my mind, but did not linger. Then there was the Inbal Dance Theater, the company that was formed by Sarah Levitanai. The company was formed in 1949 with young dancers and singers recruited from the newly arrived Yemenite immigrants after Israel's independence. While Levitanai's goal was to preserve and develop authentic Yemenite movement material in order to create an Israeli modern dance theater, Inbal was viewed by the Israeli dance community as an ethnic folk dance group. Why did I not quit my modern dance training with Gertrude Krauss and join Inbal was a question I was asked several times by various people. 
In the early 50s, the cultural gap between the Inba dancers and myself was too big. I also viewed Inba as a folk dance company, and my goals were very different. During my coming video presentation, I will screen and discuss excerpts from four works that trace my evolution as dance artist, exploring my Jewish Yemenite heritage, and also my connection to the Yiddishkeit culture. Okay. This photograph was taken in the mid-60s, and it shows me as a student at Juilliard. I composed, an, I composed an arrangement of this Yemenite Israeli folk dances prior to leaving Israeli, Israel, thinking they would be useful for presentation in Jewish community centers and earn me some money. <laughs> the photo on, okay, yeah. The photo on the, on the left represent a woman dance and the one on the right, a man dance. This photo is taken of a dance called Landscape that I created as a student in Anna Sokolov's senior choreography class at Juilliard. Anna found all our compositions to be derivative. She told us to get rid of our well-made dances and suggested that we go to a quiet space and stand there for a long time, as, for stand, and stand there for as long as needed until we found the first movement that felt true to who we were. The movement that revealed itself was a small circular movement originating in the chest that repeated itself again and again. It felt so good to do. That was a transformative discovery and became a source from which I developed further movement. Clearly, it was not a movement I ever encountered in class. I eventually recognized that this movement came from my Yemenite heritage. In this photograph, you can see the prominence of the hand gestures placement at the center of the chest, from where the newly found movement originated. My next breakthrough in de deepening my, the con my connection with the Middle Eastern heritage occurred when I met Margalit Oved, whom I knew as the lead dancer of Sara Levi Tanai's Inbal Dance Theater in Israel. While we talked, exchanging thoughts about our lives as touring artists recently turned mothers and living in the US, the idea of commissioning Margalit to create a dance for my solo repertory show was born. With a grant from the NEA in 1974, we proceeded to create Mothers of Israel dancing the story of the biblical matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel. Margalit created the dance, the text, the singing, and the drumming. This is consistent with the Yemenite traditional dance where there is no separation between these elements. My task was to present each of these women's lives at a pivotal moment that changed the course of generations to come. As a performer, I was challenged to fully embody the traditional Yemenite movement style and gestures and develop, as developed by Margalit, and to drop any affectation associated with classical modern dance training. Oh, this is Leah already. Did you see the other two? Thank you. Oh, she's speeding. Okay. When performing the Four Mothers, I felt I was giving presence and voice to my grandmothers through revealing their beauty and humanity. For the duration of the dance, I became my grandmothers. The first video excerpt you will see is taken from a warm-up Margalit taught me. This will be followed by three short excerpts from Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. Where? Grandmothers. Okay, what do we do now? This is silent because it was filmed on Super 8, film that had no sound. The following we have will have sound. So you see, Margalit, her movement now started from the pelvis, not from the chest. Did you did you hear me? Her movement starts for, and it's rippling through the spine. And it gets faster, and according to Margalit, crazier and crazier. <laughs> Thank you. 
excerpt which I'll screen are taken from my own choreography that represent my later work starting in the mid 1990s I hope you will be able to see these uh, these works in this work the integration of the circular movement I discovered early on with the fuller movement introduced by Margalit and with my own material as developed over the years. The next video is Women and Veils, a dance I choreographed to a group of women in which this integration can be seen. <laughs> Women and sorry, it's called Women and Veils. It's a long piece, yeah. It's a long piece, 11 women, lots of colors. All right. The next two duets are Negotiations and If Eve Had a Daughter, in which I allowed myself to dance again at age 60 
with my younger colleagues, Alita Hayes and Jill Sigmund. These two dances are probably my most mature and fully realized work, and they continue to give me a particular kind of joy. Here, I was able to integrate with fluidity material I discovered and learned over the many years with ease. Boundaries from east to west, from academic to folk, from generation to generation, and from inherited traditions to contemporary thinking were crossed and integrated with no, with no hesitance. Okay. Oh, okay. The first duet, Negotiations, is based on the difficult, difficult relationship between Sarah and her maid, Hagar. Rather than following the biblical story that ends with Hagar and her son's abandonment, the dance concludes with the two women negotiating eye to eye and as equals. Mother Times I Love You, can you hear me? Uh, dance to Yiddish songs and klezmer music portrays the pain, tension, and joy in a relationship between an old time dominant mother and her rebellious daughter who wishes to keep up with the sensibilities of her time. Ah, is it going? Ah, no, that's one more. Oh, am I supposed to? Ah, uh, this uh, late 90s.
<laughs> Thank you. Do you have any questions? I tell you, it's such a joy to be at this time of life, and I'm in my late 70s, that it was a, I'm able to do what I wished to do when I was young, to be kind of universal, but it went through passing through the oldest stages of learning first other heritages, then reclaiming mine, not as, you understand, not as inherited, but refound. Therefore, it has an added depth to it. And then, no problem. I can talk like my neighbors, any language you want. Because the Russians were living here, the Polish here, the Germans here. The, and the fluidity between people, well, there was mutual respect, with prejudices, of course. But we got over them. Thank you. <laughs>